Good morning and happy Easter. We extend a warm welcome to all who are worshiping with us here in person, especially all who are visitors with us, reminding everyone that there's a fellowship time following the service. We also extend a warm welcome to all who are worshiping with us virtually this morning. At this time, we build community by sharing announcements and joys and concerns with one another. And Sarah will happily take the microphone to those who have things to share. We'll start on the deck, okay. Hi, I'm Sherry Lovell of the Deacons. On this day of joy and celebration, it is my joy to share with you an update on our No Barriers Period project. We are very close to the finish line. All the sewing is completed and we are wrapping it up with application of snaps. Two dates to keep in mind. On April 14th, we will have a final assembly session during fellowship hour. During that session, we will fill our drawstring bags with all the elements of the hygiene kits. And then on April 21st, we will have a blessing of the shipping boxes during <laughs> worship and send them off to South Sudan. There will be more details to come. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Are there other things to share this morning? Okay. Good morning, uh, Gerald Bruce for, uh, for trustees. Just a reminder, and it's in your bulletin as well, that we'll be, we'll be having a spring work day, uh, April 13th, so in a couple weeks. And so look forward to seeing you there. And, also a joy, um, you may notice that our windows are very clean now. We had that done both inside and outside last week, so if, if the sun were shining, we would be able to see it. So. Okay, going to the deck. Good morning, Peg Stokes. Um, I have a concern. I'm asking for prayers for my husband and myself. Uh, on top of the prostate and the heart valve replacement that we're looking at. Uh, Bill broke his arm on March 21st. It's his right arm, so he's not very functional. But we're learning how to advocate together. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anything else to share this morning? Okay, behind you, Sarah, over here, Chris. Good morning, Chris Brennan. Uh, this week it's fairy house making time. We have a little workshop from two, I mean ten until two, and then Wednesday eve Tuesday, <laughs> Tuesday, sorry, ten until two, and then Wednesday Wednesday evening six until eight. We have a lot of bases to start with and a lot of materials. If you don't have anything, just come. Uh, some of the fairy houses will be for the decorations for our fairy tale uh, festival at the end of April. Thank you. Many, many years ago, when we were newly married and very young, we wondered if we would live long enough to see the turn of the century, because we would be very old after all, 63. <laughs> but we made that event, and this week, we are both celebrating our 87th birthdays. <laughs> Hi, Janet Danik, and in celebration, two people who won't be happy of me doing this, but today is Sean and Amy McDonald's 23rd wedding anniversary. Oh. 
Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to announce that registration is open and has been open for our church's version of Vacation Bible School this summer called Compassion Camp. It is going to be June 3rd through 6th, and it will focus on all the things that we need to survive and thrive as humans, food, water, community, um, shelter, and I'm pretty excited about it. So it's June 3rd through 6th and the 9th from 9 to 12, and it is cost-free to families, so please um, consider that and let me know if you have any more questions. Thank you. Oh, it is open for kindergarten through fifth graders, and that can be incoming kindergartners. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, seeing no other hands, I invite us now to enjoy the prelude.
Let's join together in the call to worship. Christ is risen. 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 Come, let us worship God. standing while we join in the unison prayer of confession. God of new awakenings, we confess that we would rather stay asleep. We are afraid to hope and have our hope shattered. We are afraid to dream and find our dreams deferred. Break us open like the tomb so that new life may pour forth. Give us the faith to believe, to hope, to dream anew. Let us live as people of your resurrection. Amen.
Christ has risen from the grave to bring us out of the shadow of death, to free us from all fear, to liberate our souls into newness of life. This is good news indeed. Thanks be to God. And now as adults are seated, I invite children and youth to meet me in the front. Good morning. It's so nice to see your smiling faces this morning. Did anyone notice anything different behind me this morning? A bunch of colorful flowers. We don't always have flowers, do we? Is that what you saw? Today is Easter, and that's exactly why we have these beautiful, colorful flowers. They're there to help us to celebrate Easter. And yes, after worship and after Sunday school today, when your parents come and meet you, there's going to be an Easter egg hunt outside. Yeah, We better put our coats on though, huh, today. Yeah. So this morning, I would like your help in telling the story of Easter from the Bible using colors. Just like we have beautiful colors of flowers. So yes, of an eggs, yes. So I'm wondering if you, could you each take a couple of these and, here, your daddy can help you maybe. Grab a couple colors and then pass them around. And then we're gonna take some colors, maybe give one back here. Here, Fidel, you wanna start some colors? You ever, we can have two or three or how many? Yeah, you wanna go ahead and you can pass them out. That's great. Okay, does everybody have some colors? Thank you. You can you have your colors? Okay, great. Do you want any other colors? You're good. You can have two. Do you have a couple? You just want one? Okay. Perfect. You're welcome to keep these when we're done. Oh, you have a lot of colors to keep track of. Huh? Oh my goodness, you have a lot of colors too. Okay, because this is gonna be a little tricky, all right? So when I tell the story and you hear one of the colors that you have, I want you to hold it up as high as you can, or if you're really feeling lots of energy, you can stand up and hold it, okay? But if you hear the color, you're gonna lift it up in the air. Does everyone understand? All right, so this is the story. Early on the first day of the week, friends of Jesus named Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome got up while it was still black as night to go to the place where Jesus was laid. Okay, we've got a black there, the black as night. It was so quiet, hardly a bird was singing yet. The women all felt sad because their friend Jesus had died. They walked down the dusty brown road. Hold it up. Brown road, the brown road, there we go. The brown road on the dark night, good, all right. Thank you. They told each other stories about Jesus. They remembered the time that they followed Jesus around the countryside, and they remembered the time in which Jesus sat on a green hill. And he taught the people. They remembered the time when there wasn't enough food for all the people to eat only five brown loaves of bread and two blue fish. Oh, good job, blue fish. All right. But when Jesus blessed the food, there was enough for everyone. Soon, the women reached the garden where Jesus' body had been put in a tomb with a big stone to cover the entrance. They found the 
gray stone, yes, the gray stone, had been rolled from the tomb. But when they went inside, they looked inside, they couldn't see Jesus. While they were trying to figure out what had happened, suddenly an individual in dazzling white. What? We don't have any white? I forgot to put white in. <laughs> in dazzling white. <laughs> and the women were alarmed, but he said, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place that they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Then the three women remembered what Jesus had told them, and they left the tomb to tell all of Jesus' friends what they had seen. As they left the garden, the yellow sun, the yellow sun, yes, the yellow sun <laughs> was shining in the clear blue sky. Yes, the blue sky. Yes. And they noticed beautiful flowers of pink and red and purple. And all these years later, we remember how the women went to the tomb and how they found it empty. We celebrate on Easter Sunday with flowers of all colors. Beautiful. We give thanks that Jesus was alive in a new way, and we give thanks to God singing, Alleluia. So you're welcome to keep the colors. What do you think we might do with them? <coughs> but, <coughs> okay, that's an idea. We could put them together and make a mosaic. Whatever you want to do with them, you're welcome to take them. You can even take these extras to your Sunday school? Do you want to carry those for now? Okay, thanks. Any questions about the story or what we did? Okay, let's have a prayer. Dear God, how good it is to come together this morning to celebrate Easter with brightly colored flowers and the promise of new life. Like the women in our story, may we take the joy that we experience this day back into the world where we can share it with other people. Amen. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. All right. You may go with Ms. Erica and other teachers.
A reading from Acts 10, 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he's the Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. On a rough-hewn cross, Jesus proclaimed, It is finished. His friends scattered and hid in darkness, weeping. It was over. For three days, those who loved Jesus huddled, their hearts trembling, their faces swollen with tears. They would no longer see Jesus. At the dawn of a new day, three courageous women come to anoint the body of the one who they love. Here is that story. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he had told you. So they went, and they fled from the tomb for terror and amazement. And they said nothing to anyone, 
for they were afraid. So ends our readings for this day. It seems like such a long time ago that some of us gathered in this sanctuary on Ash Wednesday, although the temperature was about the same. <laughs> At that service, which also fell on St. Valentine's Day, I spoke about the importance of us having a vulnerable heart. In my message that evening, I shared a quote from the Christian author C.S. Lewis. When reflecting on the importance of remaining open to love, Lewis wrote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. Put in that casket safe, dark, motionless, airless. It will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. This past Thursday, during the Monday Thursday service of worship, we retold the story of the events leading up to and including the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus. According to that story, the women disciples of Jesus watched as their beloved friend was crucified on a Roman cross. As C.S. Lewis has shared, the hearts of those women were wrung out and broken. It is with vulnerable hearts that these women come to the tomb on Sunday morning. And according to the author of Mark, the women don't find the body of their friend, but rather an empty tomb and the promise that something new has begun. For you see, it is now up to them to continue the ministry of Jesus, a ministry that Jesus once described using the words of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me. God has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of God's favor. With renewed hope, the women who came to the tomb that morning share what they have learned with the other disciples. Together, they carry on the ministry of Jesus, proclaiming the good news of God's love for all people through their words and through their actions. And for 2,000 years, individuals have continued that ministry. One of those individuals is Clarence Jordan. And if you're not familiar with who Clarence Jordan is or need a reminder, let me share a portion of his story with you. Clarence Jordan grew up the seventh of ten children in a small town in Georgia. Although Clarence came from a very prominent family in his community, he was troubled by the racial and economic injustices of his town. Wishing to improve the lives of sharecroppers, he enrolled uh, at the University of Georgia in order to receive a degree in agriculture. During his time at the university, however, he became convinced that the roots of poverty are spiritual as well as economic. He then enrolled in the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and following graduation was ordained as a Southern Baptist pastor. During his time in seminary, he was blessed to meet and marry Florence Kroger. In 1942, Clarence and Florence, along with their good friends, the Englands, moved to a 440-acre tract of land near Americus, Georgia. They went there to create an interracial Christian farming community. They named the farm Koinonia which is a Greek word meaning communion or fellowship. Those living on the Koinonia farm were committed to 
equality of people, rejection of violence, practicing ecology, and sharing ownership of all possessions. Not surprisingly, these practices were scorned by the local chapter of the Ku Klux Klan. There were numerous caustic encounters with local racist residents. In response to those conflicts, Clarence Jordan was often heard to say, your choice seems quite clear. It's whether you will follow your granddaddy or Jesus Christ. In 1965, Millard and Linda Fuller visited Koyanania Farm. They were planning to just stay for a few hours, but they were so inspired by Clarence Jordan that in 1968, they made it their home. The organization eventually changed its name to Koinonia Partners and started a number of ventures to build and sell affordable homes with a no interest rate mortgage for low income families. Millard and Linda Fuller, after five years, went to build homes in the, Dominic or the Democratic Republic of Congo. That in turn led in 1976 to the creation of Habitat for Humanity. Clarence Jordan, whose vision of equality led to the creation of Habitat for Humanity, connected such work to the resurrection of Jesus. He wrote, Jesus' resurrection is not to convince the incredulous nor to reassure the fearful but to enkindle the believers. The proof that God raised Jesus from the dead is not the empty tomb, but the full hearts of his transformed disciples. The crowning evidence that he lives is not a vacant grave, but a spirit-filled fellowship. Not a rolled away stone, but a carried away church. The crowning evidence that he lives is not a vacant grave, but a spirit-filled fellowship, not a rolled away stone, but a carried away church. As revealed in this statement, Clarence Jordan didn't see the resurrection as simply something that happened thousands of years ago. Rather, he saw the reality of the resurrection is expressed in the actions of those who carry on the ministry of Jesus in the present age. With full hearts, followers of Jesus have done that for hundreds of years, founding hospitals and service organizations sharing their financial and material resources, establishing schools and empowering young people, building homes and planting gardens, sharing in the work of creating greater justice and peace in the world. When I hear Clarence Jordan say, the crowning evidence that Jesus lives is not a vacant grave, but a spirit-filled fellowship. Not a rolled away stone, but a carried away church. I think of this church, the United Church of Christ, Midland, Michigan. There are so many ways in which we as a church live out the resurrection, turning despair into hope, hate into love, and death into new life. In the tradition of Clarence Jordan and Millard Fuller, this church has been involved in Habitat for Humanity for decades. We have used our hands to build houses. We have provided half the resources for a mortgage. We offer our financial support to both the local and the international organization. Throughout this past season of Lent, as Dr. Sherry shared with us earlier, dozens of people in this church have been involved in the No Barriers Period Project, helping to ensure that young women are able to attend school in South Sudan, a school that our friend Rick has started. 
Every month, volunteers show up at the shelter house resale shop and the food bridge pantry center in order to assist those organizations. Members and friends of this church volunteer countless hours each week, tutoring children, driving people to medical appointments, and delivering food to shut-ins. This church provides a safe space for young people to come together for support, learning, and service, and we offer faith-based human sexual education through the OWL program. Every week, care is given to those within our fellowship who are faced with medical or other challenges. On a daily basis, members and friends of this church live out their faith in their places of employment. With generous, generous hearts, this church gives 20% of its budget to life-giving benevolences. And that amount doesn't even include all of the special offerings or the help that we offer through the pastor's discretionary and emergency funds. Like Jesus, this church boldly proclaims that all people are loved by God and deserve justice. This is something this church has been doing since it got involved in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. We proclaim a message of equality from the pulpit, and we take it to the world in various ways, including hosting concerts and showing up at pride events. This is by no means an exhaustive, exhaustive list of the ways in which we are a carried away church. Nor does it imply that there won't be many more ways in which we will get carried away in the future. The possibilities of living out the resurrection are endless. On the first Sunday after the crucifixion, three women came and found an empty tomb. With vulnerable hearts, they embraced the responsibility of carrying on the ministry of Jesus, a ministry of sharing God's love with the world. With vulnerable hearts, may we continue to do the same. Amen. Let's stand as we join together in a new creed found in your bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit, we trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God.
As you are seated, I invite you to join with me in a time of prayer. God of new life, on this Easter morning, we celebrate that death could not stop your love from flowing into the world, and that for 2,000 years, followers of Jesus have lived as people of the resurrection. Like the stone rolled away from the tomb, may our hearts be open to all that you would share with us. Help us to trust that you love us unconditionally, and that because of your love, we are able to love one another. We give thanks, O oh God, for this church, which is a spirit-filled fellowship. We celebrate the many ways in which we are able to live the promise of resurrection through our acts of care and compassion. We pray that you will continue to reveal to us how we can offer comfort to those who are struggling, companionship to those who are lonely, support to those who are afraid, and the sharing of resources with those who are in need. And now, dear God, it is out of love for self and for others that we enter a time of silent prayer. Now, gracious God, we add to our silent prayers, prayers for Bill and for Peg. May your comfort and your strength be with them as they navigate medical issues. May your spirit guide Bill's doctors as they offer their assistance to him. On this joyful day of Easter celebration, we also celebrate the birthdays of Marilyn and Carl and the wedding anniversary of Amy and Sean. May your blessings continue to be upon these two couples. Now, O oh God, it is in unity with one another and with Christ's spirit-filled church of every time and place that we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
Most gracious God, we do indeed give thanks for this carried away church and for every opportunity that we have to share our gifts. We ask that you would bless these gifts and bless our lives that we may continue to share the ministry of the resurrected Jesus, sharing your love with all the world. For it is in Christ's spirit that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. On this Easter Sunday, we come to this meal to know the love of the risen Christ. To share this meal, you don't have to look a certain way, worship a certain way, or love a certain way. You don't have to believe what I believe or what others believe. You just have to come exactly as you are. So come, find healing, wholeness, and hope for the journey. Come, knowing that this table is open to all. Let us pray. God of new life, we join your Easter people of all times and traditions in sharing this meal that connects us to you and to this community of love that gives us strength. We give thanks that in the fullness of time, Jesus lived in our midst, teaching us the importance of forgiveness and mercy, offering healing and restoration, and bringing us into communion with you. We celebrate the promise that death did not have the final word and that the love of Christ continues to flow through the world. And so it is, with all creation, we sing your praises. O oh God, on this great day of celebration, we recall Jesus' instruction to remember him by sharing bread and wine, and how at the table Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples, for saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. O oh God, consecrate by your Holy Spirit these gifts that we have prepared. Bless each one of us that we may be filled with a renewed sense of joy as we live in the promise of your eternal love. In Christ's name and spirit we pray, amen. What could be better than that? <laughs> this bread that we break reminds us that we are in communion with God, with one another, and with the world that God so dearly loves. And this cup that we share reminds us that God's grace is pouring into our lives every moment of every day. These are the gifts of God.
This, my friends, is the bread of life. Take and eat. Now let's join in the unison prayer of thanksgiving, found in your bulletin. Life-giving God, we have come to this table with open hearts to receive the gifts you share. 
through bread that has been broken and shared. We have been renewed and refreshed. Open our eyes to see the ways in which we can share your love with others. In the spirit of Christ, we pray. Amen. Having been renewed by this time of celebration and the promise that God's love could not be contained by a tomb, let us go back into the world with full hearts, sharing the good news of God's love with our words of support and our acts of compassion, going forth to be the body of Christ, going in the peace and in the joy of God. Amen.